Major support for these programs is provided by Bank of America, Merrill Lynch, and Perfect Building Maintenance, New York Community Bank, All Nation Renovation, Kilroy Architectural Windows, New York's Window Company, Greenberg Traurig, LLP, m and Bank. Additional support is provided by AVR Realty Company, LLC, Ackman Ziff Real Estate Group, LLC, Bingham McCutcheon, LLP, Briarwood Organization, Capital One Bank, C.B. Richard Ellis, James Orfanides, Centurion Holdings, Cushman and Wakefield, Dimes Savings Bank of Williamsburg, Douglaston Development, DDG Partners, Eastern Consolidated, Hal Fetner, Durst Fetner Residential, Friedman LLP, Accountants and Advisors, Gemini Real Estate Advisors, LLC, Genova, Burns and Gian Tomasi, Grubb and Ellis, Investors Savings Bank, Jack Jaffa and Associates Real Estate Consultants, James D. Kuhn Real Estate Institute at Syracuse University, Madison Realty Capital, Massey Knackle Realty Services, Meridian Capital Group, Margolin Weiner and Evans LLP, Certified Public Accountants and Business Advisors, Newmark Knight Frank, RAL Development Services, The Spandrel Group LLC, Siami Development, SJP Properties, Site Comply, Sterling and Sterling, Stephen Napolitano, The Wickhoff Group, Urban American. call it Soho. They call it the financial district of Lower Manhattan. South Beach, Wynwood, Center City, the Upper West Side. Who's been responsible for the changing of these neighborhoods? Who's the visionary? I don't know, but I've been very fortunate that I have him today. I have Tony Goldman, the chairman and CEO of Goldman Properties. Nice to be here, Michael. So Tony, you know, you told me, which I think is really interesting, you, you were adopted, right. and uh, you, you were adopted, and uh, subsequently, we'll get to it later on, right. you, 55 years later, you, you found your, your original parents. Right. Your parents who, who adopted you were Charlie and Tilly? Tilly and Charlie Goldman. Charlie was a uh, garmento, as we would he say. Was a, he was a... A coat manufacturer. Only garmentos would call garmentos garmentos. But other than that, they would call them... They, would they were schmata people. They were, they were schmata they were, they people, were, but he was a coat manufacturer. He was a, he was a ladies, man. ladies coat manufacturer, middle price coats. Thirty nine ninety five, right? Thirty nine ninety five, um, And uh, he was quite a guy. He uh, came from sweatshop parentage. His father was a tailor in sweatshops and... Polish immigrants. Changed their name. Changed from uh, Poznikowski to Goldman at Ellis Island, like millions of other people have the same similar story. And, and you grew up on the Upper West Side of Manhattan? I grew up, my first home when I was adopted at uh, a month after birth, um, I grew up at 55 Central Park West. So you were adopted when you were one month old? I was adopted at birth, and then um, by the time I was processed through the trail back to New York, uh, it was a month. Tell me about your, your childhood. You, we were talking about this. You went to PS6? I, I went to PS6. I went to the old PS6, which was at uh, 85th Street between Madison and Park. Then I was in the first third grade class at PS6 when it moved to the new building at 81st, 82nd Street and Madison Avenue. And I was there until through up to the seventh grade. And then I went over to Walden across the park uh, to a progressive school. And I graduated uh, barely through uh, <laughs> at Walden in the 12th grade. Now, you said to me when we met, something happened before you graduated. When you were 15 years of age, you went to the state of Israel and you worked on a kibbutz. And what happened there? You, you well, learned a, some a, very important, interesting. It, it, a lot of my, a lot of my, my, my interest and background, I was fortunate. I grew up uh, from privileged parents uh, who exposed me to the best of everything. Uh, and uh, each one had their own particular uh, influence on me. Uh, 
But what I wanted to touch mostly in uh, my life was a sense of a deep sense of work ethic and uh, and and what the laborer really felt like. Uh, coming from a privileged house, you don't really do that. You but don't you understand did go, that. But you did tell me you went with your dad to the to the warehouse, to the factory. You were there. Well, I lived at the factories as a teenager during the summers, and I worked every station in the factories out in New Jersey. Um, Burlington, New Jersey, and Warwick, New Jersey. My father built a, a big coat company. Uh, and then summers, and I would go to camp, but I, would, I also was hungry to go to Israel. Um, I, we did not, we were kind of agnostics as growing up as Jews in New York. Uh, so there was never a heavy influence other than what my grandparents brought to us on a Friday night, we'd go there. But there wasn't much pressure there. We were f very culturally Jewish, but not very religiously Jewish. So going to Israel was a was a, a marvelous experience for me. I was was a farm worker, and um, you know I worked. I, I picked uh, I picked apples. I picked melons. Melons are tough because you got to go down on the floor for that. So you really understand what physical labor is about when you go through that process, and it has served me well because everybody who ever has worked for me, uh, I've I've done a lot of the jobs that they've done for me, but I have a respect for them in a way that uh, I never would have if I hadn't done their job. So you graduated high school yep. and you go to Emerson College. How did you decide on Emerson College? Um, well, I, I had a very tough um, academic uh, experience. I had terrible reading problems as a child. Dyslexia and, uh, and an overbearing father who uh, was not patient with my <laughs> dyslexia. And uh, it, it was a very, a very difficult and troubling time. And as anybody who's had that experience, you know, it affects your self-image and, uh, and you think you're stupid and blah, blah, blah. Um, I fortunately was able to really um, uh, rise to the occasion in athletics. And I found that uh, I got the opportunity to go to Emerson College in Boston for performing arts. I thought that, and my family thought, and uh, the people that directed me there thought that I could I could I could excel in that area, now, even though I had a reading problem. I, I thought I could get through it. Something interesting happens on the first day of school, right? What happens in the first day oh. of school? Uh, some some beautiful girl from Euless, Long Island. What well, they happened? wrote a song about this in uh, in South Pacific. It's called "Some Enchanted Evening." But it was not an evening; it was an afternoon, right? You may meet a stranger. Well, anyway, I met my beautiful Janet. She was standing there uh, across the she room. She was a freshman also? She was a freshman, and I was in the back of the room. Everybody else was seated, and she was posed up against the fireplace, and she just knocked me out. I didn't know who she was. In the jacket? Well, well, I mean, my heart went out. I, I, I was the first time I was that. I was instantly in love at first sight. I, I didn't even know what that meant. but And uh, then a couple of days I was trying to, how do I meet this gal? And uh, she came down, uh, uh, friends put us together with a group of people, and she came down the stairs one day, and she was so anxious to get away from home at the time, she forgot her winter coat. Now, that was an opening for me, and um, I took mine off and insisted that she, uh, she take my coat. And um, she thought I was the nicest guy she ever met. And you married her at 22? Married her at 22. A and at 30... 34, we were divorced. We and, had two kids. Uh, and, and 43, Jessica, you got remarried. Jessica and Joey, and 43, we got remarried. We have to go back to those. Okay, so in college, you were in Carnival. You you, you excelled. You had a, a lot of fun. And four years of college, what were you? What were you going to do at that time? You well, could have, you know, Pop could have sent you to the garment center. You know, you could have been in the coat business with the cousins or the other relatives. What well, happened? Um, interesting. I mean, I, I, I thrived uh, because I, I had, it was the first chance. As a lot of folks thrive when they get to college. Either they, they sink or they swim. And I thrived because I, I was independent. I had nobody over me. I could really experience my own leadership and my own creativity. And I really moved moved up in a socially, and I moved up in the uh, in the performance ranks in my my school. Uh, and um, I never my my mother was very was very uh, important in influencing me not to go to work for my father. She knew what that was about. So you graduate, you go to Fort Dix. I go. I graduate. Reserve. I graduate in '65, uh, 
And before that, this was early Vietnam, I, I enlist in mm. the uh, Reserves. Army Reserves in Boston while I was at school so that I would not you know, be exposed. I opened a real estate office in Boston uh, with a guy named Arthur Barron. We had a, re a renting office up in Brookline. And then in December of 65, I went to the Army. So you six months? I did my six months. In the middle of my six months, at the end of, end of my basic training, my father uh, um, dropped dead of a heart attack. And um, he was 63 years old. And uh, it, was, it was a crushing period for me, but I finished. I had gotten engaged to Janet during that period of time, and I finished my service and went to work for my Uncle Milton. Now, my family... Uncle Milton my family was, was, was mom's was mom, brother. Was mom's brother. And, uh, Milton, he, uh, Milton, Milton Schwartz, Schwartz, Mickey Schwartz. Mickey Schwartz, m and uh, right? Uh, SNS Management. SNS Management. Now, Mickey was really one of the, one of the real great, classy old-timers. Um, old-timers from my perspective today. But he was in real estate business. He, was, he started out with his father in the crockery business on 14th Street. So he was a trader. You know, he was a trader. And, and, but a very smart, very smart real estate guy and a, and a, a generalist. So we had garden, he had garden apartments and an owner operator. Uh, he had garden apartments in Queens uh, and Auburndale and Kew Gardens. And we had uh, property, we had uh, property in the meat market. And this was in the, you know, 66 um, <clears throat> on Madison Avenue, some small office buildings. He had an office building at 366 Madison. So I was the management assistant. So I learned all the ropes. Hey, 150 bucks a week? Uh, that was, at first it was 100 and a quarter. I got a raise to 150, but that was it. That was it. But you and Janet bought an apartment before, right? Janet and I bought an apartment. Janet was a teacher at uh, Brandeis High School, and she was earning 200 a week. So um, uh, together we, uh, actually we bought that apartment for, I think, 18,000? 18,000. 18, 18,000 on West 54th Street. At 25 West 54th. Great block, great unit, great start. So one day, as you were saying to me, Uncle Milton, you'd, you'd bring to Uncle Milton at the end of the night, like my glass of water, you'd bring him the schnapps. He would ask for a, a glass of scotch. And one night, what happened? Well, the great thing about Milton was that if you got him where he wasn't in his, in his routine of the daily activity, uh, where he was, he was, you know, a pretty rough, tough, um, abusive kind of person to some of the people that work closely with him. But I brought him his coffee at 7.30 to 8.30 in the morning. We'd sit and we'd talk real estate. And I brought him his scotch, Doors on the Rocks, at 6.30 to 7.30 at night. And that's, that's where I learned my business. That's where I learned the real estate business, working for him for two and a half years, you know, of course, in the trenches doing six, six, seven days a week, renting apartments, drawing up leases, handling rent control issues, handling maintenance, doing, uh, d doing everything that a management person needs to do to learn how to run the business. So what happens? You say to him, Uncle Milton, you got this property on the west side. Well, want to buy it? He was always tortured by, uh, by uh, this, this conflict with rent control tenants, old rent control tenants. And he considered them animals that, you know, meanwhile, he considered them animals because they had a deal. And, and he, and, uh, you know, by law, they had a deal, and he couldn't do anything about it. So it would just, it got him terribly burned, terribly, just ate him up. And I said to him, after seeing what it did to him, I just said, Mickey, I said, you got to look at this. I'm 24 years old, mind you. You got to look at this in a different way. You know, this is not good for you, and it's not good for the situation. Have you thought about coming to a civil interaction, inter interaction with the tenants there? So he leans back in his chair. He kind of puts this smirky smile on his face, takes a sip of, sip of his scotch, and he says, you think you, uh, you think you know what to do? Why don't you buy the building from me? Now, the problem was the building was on a lease. It was a 14-year net lease, a nice, chunky piece of real estate, but it was Upper dying West side, fast. Up, Upper was, West Side, too. It was too. 92nd, 93rd Street in 1968. Tough was. neighborhood also. Tough neighborhood. That, tough neighborhood. The Upper West Side was a tough, tough neighborhood. neighborhood. But it was 92 apartments, eight stores, a block front, 92nd and 93rd. And, and I knew the building because I worked the building. Um, so he said, why don't you buy it from me? And, and a 14-year lease is a tough deal because you've got, 
you got not a lot of time to work with. Um, and I said, give me 24 hours. Set a fair price and give me 24 hours. Let me talk to my, my, my wife and uh, let's see how much money we got. Um, and, and she came, uh, came home, and she, she was concerned because I was getting this twitch in my eye. She says, hey, you know, sweetheart, maybe it's time for you to leave. And he wouldn't give me a raise from $150 to $175 a week. So it was time to leave. And, I, and so the next day I go back in there. She says, let's go for it. Let's, we took all of our wedding money, all the money we had, and he set a price, uh, $125,000 with twenty cash, he took back a 105 mortgage, which was a third leasehold mortgage on top of a land lease, which there was no options to buy. So, so at I leveraged well. At, at 24 Goldman Properties Thoughts? At 24, I left him on uh, December 1st of 1968. I opened my doors. He gave me a few buildings to manage for him, smaller buildings, because he knew I was a... Uh, Need a struggling? I was, I was, no, but he knew I was also um, a hard I, worker. I was a hard worker, and I would also, and, and he taught me well, and I would, I would represent him well. You, you get involved with the West Side. You subsequently take ownership, and you always like, you know, in Judaism and Hebrew, there's there's something called high eighteen. Mm. You, you, what do you buy? Eighteen properties on the West Side. Well, what what I did, I developed over time. I developed a model that has served me well over years. Uh, when I finally wound up buying the land underneath the, the, uh, the, the, the building that I bought from him and I paid him off at a discount and, and, and was able to come out with a bunch of money, I was able to buy a whole bunch of brownstones and on, in the same area in the 80s on the west side. And I started to build a, a portfolio all in one area. And I've always worked all in one area. And I try to stay uh, within a context of a, of a community. And, and the 18 buildings, to me, was a number. It's a high, whether it was 16 or 19. It usually it matter, ended up it around 18. It was the volume of scale. It was the volume of scale. And I was able to buy those in an area quickly and then have an impact on the change of the neighborhood. Soho. What happens? Um, I went to Soho in the middle 70s when I was uh, kind of up to here with residential and small units. I was feeling claustrophobic as a New Yorker. I, I felt that s apartments, the way developers and architects design them, were limiting, and that a creative-minded person with a, with, a, with, a, with a desire for space uh, had no place to go. So what did Tony Goldman know about a bar and a restaurant? Well, first I went to Soho. I said, this has got to be the greatest neighborhood in the world, probably in the, certainly in New York City. I was touched by the architecture. I've always been impassioned by the architecture of a neighborhood because of the scale of the buildings, how it relates to the pedestrian. And, um, and I learned in buying about 18 buildings in Soho in the um, mid to late A 70s. They have a community, so you, you feel like you need I a learned, restaurant and a bar. I learned that in order to, to be able to draw people and convert and, uh, and ignite a community, you needed to open a restaurant, which is the only device that can draw thousands of people to a targeted market that you're trying to attract. So what do you open? So, uh, but nobody would come there because there was no restaurants there. So you had to be the first guinea pig on the, on the plot to be able to do so. I opened the great Green, Green, Street, Green Street Cafe in uh, December 1st of 1979 in a garbage truck garage um, on, at 101 Green Street in the middle of the block, Princeton Spring. 26 years of age now. I was um, about 26 years of age. No, maybe a little bit. Yeah, about 26, 27 years old. Yep. And um, in the Soho kitchen. No, I was a little older than that. In Soho little, kitchen. I was older than that. I was about 30. I was actually about 33. Okay. Soho kitchen. That was a. Uh, that was a. Um, I actually opened the kitchen of Green Street, in where Soho kitchen is today. Building department made me move the kitchen and build it underneath because I was oversized. So the kitchen of the old Green Street became the Soho Kitchen and Bar. Two different products that drew two different kinds so of customers. So Soho, then what? And I ran them both. How did you decide to go down to the, the suburb of Manhattan, of the Jewish community, Miami Beach? Well, that was, that was interesting. I, I had a partner, um, Stephen Ann Fang, in, in, some of the, in, in some of our Soho stuff. And uh, Stephen said, let's take a look at Miami. And I was, you know, I was up to here with developing Soho and running my restaurants at night and 
having uh, joint custody with my kids, uh, with my wife and the kids. So I had a full plate, but this, it was very compelling, the idea that, that Steve said Miami, and we talked about Miami, we said that this has got to be the next great international city of this country because of its proximity to South and Central America and the proximity to the rest of the United States and the East Coast and Europe. It's something to look at. So we went down there in 82, and uh, we jumped around. We looked at uh, downtown at Flagler Street, and that was the issues there. And We settled on Coconut Grove. It didn't even look at the beach. We set it on Coconut Grove because we were looking in, in uh, pedestrian areas. And, and Coconut Grove had this wonderful sense of bohemian quality to it. And I liked it. We bought four buildings and he would go one month, I'd go one month. But it was, you know, it was a single tenant deal, so it was not operational. I didn't like what was going on there. It was turning suburban. I was not interested. The soul, to me, was gone. And I was, I was out. Uh, I said to Steve, Steve, look, just set a price. and. You pay me in three years, and you know you work South Beach. South Beach. So a friend of mine, a friend of mine, said, "Listen, check this thing out over there before you come back to New York." I went out to South Beach, out MacArthur Causeway, I down Fifth Street. I hit the end of Fifth Street, Ocean Drive, and um, it was like that moment I met Janet. Uh, it was it was that instant moment. I actually, I had that moment when I walked into the Green Street Cafe too. Uh, so I knew something was something was happening, and I got out of the car between Fifth Street and Sixth Street, and I said, "I just discovered the American Riviera," uh, and my heart was pounding, my hands were schwitzing, and it was it was a moment. Um, I made the decision there. I didn't do any um, any uh, what do they call due diligence. None of that. It was just it was so clear to me what I was doing. I called my office in New York. I said, "You guys get down here." I've seen the course of direction that we're going to be going in for the next many decades. I had um, uh, just, not yet remarried, but just about remarried Janet, went back to New York, pulled the gang together, went back down to Florida. This was about December of <coughs> 85. I bought a building a month, uh, November of 85, bought a building a month for a year and a half under the radar. Different, 18, 18, 18 well, that of course. Was, right? That was a beautiful high. Nine properties in Ocean Drive. I became the chairman of the Ocean Drive Association and became the and kind of And now you the, decided, forget the restaurant, we're going to open a hotel? I, I opened a hotel. First, I had to run the old people's hotel just to get a swing of it. Then I did that of uh, my first hotel. Then I opened Lucky's, which was a four-star killer restaurant in the Park Central Hotel where they wouldn't lend me any. No banks would lend us money. We were redlined. Uh, you could the the the, the um, insurance companies um, uh, would would lock you out. You had five to minutes. We got to get other stuff. So well, okay, it was so a whole we, long story. Anyway, after, we made a great success out of that. Then but we you come, worked it. Then you come back to the financial district of Lower Manhattan. What happens there? Well, every five, six, seven years, I look for a new neighborhood, and um, and and that time uh, Wall Street was ripe. It was 80, 92, 93, and we were cooking everywhere. I mean, South Beach had just kicked off because I had discovered the, the fashion photography industry, which was the economic driver that really set South Beach alive and that brought the activity and the publicity. And, uh, and Wall Street, Wall Street was, I thought, the last great opportunity to be able to put your fingerprints on the best future neighborhood of New York City. Because I, at that time, it was 27% vacant and there was um, uh, an opportunity there to create a residential mixed-use support system to a, an area that was- And you bought buildings over there, I and bought, you also opened up the- uh, I bought a whole bunch of buildings there, Kitchen. and I was on the line to make a deal with Lehman Brothers to, uh, to, to finance me, and I, I stepped away from the table. Because in my business, you can't be pushed by uh, an ROI on their clock, and, uh, and I, just, I just didn't do it. Philadelphia, Santa City. Philadelphia, went to Philadelphia, and then um, after a short shot in Newark as an advisor, um, I went to, uh, to, uh, to Prudential and to Ray Chambers. I went to Philadelphia, and I said, now this is a great city that has preservation ethic, that has a wonderful core to it, great building stock, uh, terrific history, and it's within the New York zone, so it didn't change my lifestyle. Back to Florida. Back to Florida. I uh, went to Florida then in uh, about 0405, 
And my son and I decided, Joey um, and Jessica, and your my daughter daughter's Jessica's, in, in uh, we're both, we're all together. Um, Jessica runs hospitality and marketing and now in, and is running operations. Joey uh, and I decided we we're going to do a neighborhood together and he focused on this, this uh, warehouse district uh, in, on the mainland in Miami called Wynwood. It was called the Fashion District uh, where it was just a collection of warehouses. And we said, this is going to be the new urban art center of Miami. That was a tough one because it didn't have the architectural grandeur, it didn't have the ocean, it didn't have the... You know. 55 years later, you decide to try to find your original parents? Well, I'm always looking for neighborhoods, right? <laughs> I think maybe there's some kind of a correlation. Um, uh, I didn't think about it. My wife has been on my case for that since we met when we were 17. And um, finally she said, listen, it's now or never. And you found them? And she found them. She found them with maybe 10% help from myself. And it was like hitting the lottery. Uh, and I, I, was, I was united with uh, Shirley and Ray Myers. And um, uh, my, two, two my, young sister Jewish Pan, my sister Pam and my brothers Alan and Gary. Uh, and all but Pam have passed away. But we you've had, seen life uh, also. What happened a couple of years ago? Well, I mean, life has got bumps in the road, and I'm a lucky man, meaning Janet, having the Goldmans take care of me and raise me and expose me, finding my parents. Um, and then there's some things you can't avoid, which is I had a disease called IPF, interstitial pulmonary fibrosis, and it, it, it caused a deterioration in my lungs. It's a long, ste steady deterioration. And what, three years ago? And uh, just under three years ago, I had a double lung transplant at Columbia Presbyterian, and I'm good for another 100 years. That's so, uh, and knowing you... And I've you got, I, I must put a shout out to my docs, because uh, the people at Columbia Presbyterian are the absolute best, from Neil Schluger, the head of the department, Dr. Schluger, and the, the magician, the great surgeon, uh, uh, Josh Sonnet, and the terrific medical director, Salim Arkasoid, and, and uh, Nalani Ravachandra. These are people that, have, so, so, that are yeah, on yeah. me like my wife is on me. You know, so today you, besides the owning property, have two hotels? Two hotels. How many restaurants? Three. And a lot of right. property. Two CDs. I'm just producing my second CD, Singer. Janet's business, Fragments. Janet is Fragments. She is the queen of uh, fashion jewelry and fine jewelry in New York. Started the business from scratch, 27 years. 15 seconds quick, grandchildren. Names. Oh, great. Eddie. Four boys. Name the oldest, Jake. The second is James. The uh, third is AJ, Andrew Justice. And the fourth is Mackie. There's not a question that you're a builder of New York, Pennsylvania, Boston, everywhere, and I'm really happy. You're a great New Thank York you. story. Thank Miles you. Miles to go before I sleep. No question. Thanks Thank for you. having me. Major support for these programs is provided by Bank of America, Merrill Lynch, and Perfect Building Maintenance, New York Community Bank, All Nation Renovation, Kilroy Architectural Windows, New York's Window Company, Greenberg Traurig, LLP, m and Bank. Additional support is provided by AVR Realty Company, LLC, Ackman Ziff Real Estate Group, LLC, Bingham McCutcheon, LLP, Briarwood Organization, Capital One Bank, C.B. Richard Ellis, James Orfanides, Centurion Holdings, Cushman and Wakefield, Dimes Savings Bank of Williamsburg, Douglaston Development, DDG Partners, Eastern Consolidated, Hal Fetner, Durst Fetner Residential, Friedman, LLP, Accountants and Advisors, Gemini Real Estate Advisors, LLC, Genova, Burns, and Gian Tomasi, Grubb and Ellis, Investors Savings Bank, Jack Jaffa and Associates Real Estate Consultants, James D. Kuhn Real Estate Institute at Syracuse University, Madison Realty Capital, Massey Knackle Realty Services, Meridian Capital Group, Margolin Weiner and Evans, LLP, Certified Public Accountants and Business Advisors, Newmark Knight Frank, RAL Development Services, The Spandrel Group, LLC, Siami Development, 
SJP Properties, Site Comply, Sterling and Sterling, Stephen Napolitano, The Wickoff Group, Urban American.